Baruch Hashem, you're a bad Jew. Shalom. Whoa, it's you again. Welcome back to Bad Jew, the place where there is no such thing as a bad Jew. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. There are thousands of shows out there, but you chose this one. I couldn't be more grateful from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much for choosing this show to get your Jewish learning from. And with us today is reoccurring guest, David Sachs. David, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. No, it's it's really a blessing to have you here, especially as we're tuning into the high holidays. I'm really excited for Rosh Hashanah. We're going to be talking about the amazing holiday of Rosh Hashanah in a second. But David, you have an incredible WhatsApp community. Can you tell us a little bit about your WhatsApp community? Oh, yeah, that's something that I just started about a month ago. Um, it's it, I just wanted to create a more private group where I could just recommend a song that's inspiring me or just like put a little voice memo or you know, send out some stuff that I wouldn't necessarily post on Facebook or some of the other platforms or Instagram or whatever it is. So I just thought maybe make a little bit of a tighter community, people who wanted to hear that kind of stuff. And, and so far, you know, people are signing up. So it's pretty cool. It's a really terrific group. And when you enter into it, there's a ton of chesed. There's an, there's amazing content. It's incredibly, incredible positive vibes. So David, thanks again for inviting me to your amazing community. Uh, it, 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 it's really brings me a lot of joy. So thank you. Uh, yeah. So David, the topic of today's podcast, what is the real story of Rosh Hashanah? So, yeah, I think R- Rosh Hashanah is giant. It's giant. And there, there's just so many things to know about it. But the, the first thing that I think everybody needs to really understand is that, you know, so often, like when we think of it, a new year, we think of like you, you turn a calendar page over and it's almost like a bureaucratic organizational thing, sort of like the, the sun has made another circle, you know, or the earth has made another circle around the sun and now it's a new year, but it's the same universe. It's just a new year within the same universe. But the Jewish idea is actually much deeper. It's, it's like, no, 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 it's not just a new year in the same universe. It's a new universe. And so the idea being that right now we're a few days from Rosh Hashanah. So imagine like getting to the edge of a cliff and on the other side, there's just nothingness. In other words, the new universe has not been created yet. And that's what we're doing right now in in this great month called Elul, which, which leads up to Rosh Hashanah. We're sort of like preparing and we're praying and we're listening to the chauffeur and we're imagining like who we want to be and what we want the world to be and everything like that. And then on Rosh Hashanah, God begins to create this new universe to reflect who we are right now and what our dreams are for the future. Okay. So fascinating. You gave us this grand idea and I'm stuck on the idea of creating a new universe. Okay. You're blowing my mind right now because I've always interpreted it as really just the new year and that's it. But new right. universe, how does that even work? I think you're going beyond a scientific level. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, so, so we have this idea that God is constantly, like nanosecond by nanosecond, creating and recreating the universe around us. Like if you, um, if you can think of that, the old film strips, you know, now everything is digital. But back in the day, there was like a film strip and it was like, a still photograph under a still photograph under a still photograph. And if you run them together really quickly, it creates this illusion of movement, right? And actually that is kind of like the reality of what's going on around us, that it's like a moment where the universe exists and then God recreates it and recreates it. Like within this one sentence that I'm saying right now, God has created and recreated the universe countless numbers of time and it's happening so quickly around us that it seems like just everything is always here but it's not everything is being brought into existence from nothingness on a constant basis and that's a perfect metaphor for me because my background is film school so i did study film and i've held many 36 millimeter film strips before so what you're saying is before a film strip actually captures any light 
and imprints any of the the visual that that the, that the lens has captured. It's just blank. It's just an empty, raw film strip by itself. But then suddenly the new year or the new universe is like a new flash of light that captures a new frame on the film strip. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. You're extending the metaphor. I hadn't really considered that aspect of it, but but that, that does seem to make sense. And so you might ask, so then what's the difference between Rosh Hashanah, when we're saying a new universe is being brought into place, and just every moment of every year anyway, if, 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 if the universe is constantly being created, then why is Rosh Hashanah any different? So the idea is that on Rosh Hashanah, a new light is entering into the universe. And, and for the year then that follows, God is going to utilize that light to bring the world in and out of, in and out of creation constantly so that it, it's always going to look like it's here. But, but the difference is, is that on Rosh Hashanah, like if you, if you think of like, um, like here's the dough, and I'm making cookies out of the dough, right? So on Rosh Hashanah, the new dough comes in. And now throughout the year, I'm going to be making cookies out of that dough. But now we're about to have a new dough coming. I like that metaphor. And it makes me hungry too. <laughs> now, I'm curious, because you kind of hinted at this, but I also have never really understood this. So I might, I might be asking uh, too broad of a question, but can you explain the timing of Rosh Hashanah, why is it this time in the year? Right. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great question. I'd have to think aloud. I'd have to think aloud. You know what's kind of really interesting? I'll tell you one one thing about that. One answer to your question, which is, and this is so Jewish, it's almost hilarious actually. <laughs> which is that when when did we get the the commandment, the mitzvah, to create a calendar? Because, you know, when you're talking about a new year, you're talking about the calendar, right? Mm -hmm. So when did we get that command to create a, a new calendar? And the answer is, it's the very first mitzvah, believe it or not, we got when we left Egypt. God mm -hmm. said, make a calendar. Now, that's in the springtime. That's in the month of Nisan, where we celebrate Pesach, because that's, that's the holiday when we leave Egypt. And just one teaching, just... That, that always really resonates with me is that the reason why we got the commandment then is because slaves are not in control of their own time. But once we became free, we became masters of our own time. And then we were commanded to make the calendar because now time was in our control, so to speak, because we can now decide what we want to do during the day which we couldn't do when we were slaves. Do you get that? Fascinating. And we were just, I was just, I just had this conversation earlier today. For those who don't know, I run my own marketing company that does podcast production. I had a, a lunch meeting today and I was talking with a colleague that was saying that they're always weary when they have to go travel someplace to go attend a meeting because that means that you're giving up your time. That And, and it's like something that could be totally avoided with a Zoom call, right? Yeah. And I affirm that. And I said, well, yes, because time is your most valuable resource. That makes perfect sense. That's the only currency I really care about in life. Yeah, totally. So, so now listen to this. So because we still have to get to the answer to your question, why is Rosh Hashanah now at this point during the year? So now you're going to hear something like kind of mind bending, which is that since we created the calendar uh, in the springtime, you know, right after the holiday of, of Passover, that month, Nisan, when we left Egypt, that then is called the first month of the year, right? Because that's when we made the calendar. Which means, and here's the crazy part, Rosh Hashanah, which is right now, which is the new year, is actually the first day of the seventh month of the year. Which means, drum roll please, we celebrate the new year in the middle of the year. Wait, I don't get it. I actually don't get that. That's that's to me. That's the equivalent importance of a half birthday. It doesn't seem like it's important <laughs> anymore when you say it like that. Well, it's it it is important. It's actually it's it's actually in, incredibly important because think of it this way: 
You know, a lot of times, when do you have the most excitement for a project? Usually at the beginning. Or you could say maybe at the end, because you're about to finish the project. So isn't it interesting that God tells us to renew everything when we're in the middle of the year? That's a lot of times when people are ready to give up or where they've absolutely run out of steam. And so God, right in the middle of the year, says, renew everything and start all over. So you're saying as in, it's natural for us to lose our gas, if you will, in the middle of anything. Yeah. And Rosh Hashanah is supposed to be a wake-up call to get back into that motivated mindset as if you're starting the project all over again. Totally. Like one of the main teachings about blowing the chauffeur, which is Rosh Hashanah, yeah. is to wake up. Fascinating. That is a great segue into a question I've been thinking about, which is a shofar is this you know, instrument. It's made from a ram's horn. I've seen it all my life, every single Rosh Hashanah, every single year. Why a ram's horn? Why not a trumpet or any kind of horn instrument? Well, you know something? You know, trumpets do play a role in Judaism. When, when the Jews were in the desert, they, they would, before the Jews were traveling the desert, they would actually blow trumpets. So, so trumpets were like important in, 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 in Jewish history, but they, you know, it's it not, not so much right now because we kind of finished marching through the desert. Although you can think of till we get to Mashiach, till we get to the redemption, we're still marching through the desert, proverbially, proverbially, but it's a hard word to pronounce. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, why, why a ram's horn? So there's a lot of answers to that. Probably the most classic answer, though, is that God asks Abraham to bring Yitzchak up onto the altar. Now, now that's, that's, people get confused with that because people think that God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And that actually is the Torah portion that we read on Rosh Hashanah, okay? And then it seems like, if you just kind of read it superficially, God then changes his mind. And God says, well, nah, you don't have to do it. <laughs> I changed my mind. Now, theologically, God changing his mind is really problematic. And if you actually look at the words, God never asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. He just asks him to put him on an altar. Now, God knew that Abraham would be confused, right? Right. And Abraham thought God was asking him to sacrifice Isaac. But if you actually look at the words, God actually never asks Abraham to do that. Okay, so that solves the problem of God changing his mind, which he didn't do, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Abraham, this is going to get to the chauffeur in a moment, but Abraham, according to the Zohar, his real test was not whether or not to sacrifice his son or not, because he gave absolutely anything to God. That wasn't an issue whatsoever. His problem was, you ready for this? And that, according to the Zohar, this was the real test, was God told Abraham, all of your descendants are going to come from Isaac. And now, God, Isaac doesn't have any children yet. And now God is saying, sacrifice Isaac. Which sounds like a giant contradiction. How can all my descendants come from Isaac if I'm about to kill Isaac and he doesn't have any children? Right? Mm -hmm. So here was the test. Can I serve a God who seemingly contradicts himself. Can I have total faith in a God who seemingly contradicts himself? And that amazing? So Abraham, in his greatness, in his greatness, attached himself to God so absolutely, completely, even beyond, you know, this question that he had within, you know, the logic of, how God was communicating with him. So anyway, he was able to give absolutely everything up to God. 
And at that moment, right as he's raising the knife, God says, okay, you passed every single test. And at that moment, Abraham realizes there's a ram caught in the thickets in the bushes right there. And that ram, the horn of that ram is really the first chauffeur blowing. He takes the horn off the ram that's caught in the bushes and turns it into a shofar. That's it. Yeah, that's it. And then when we get the Torah at Mount Sinai, the shofar is blown again, this time by God. And there's a miracle attached to that, which is it says when a person blows a shofar, it gets louder and louder, and then you run out of breath and it gets softer and softer. But when God blew the shofar at Mount Sinai, it just got louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And they say that it was from one side of that ram that was offered instead of Isaac on the altar that was blown at Mount Sinai. And it's going to be the horn on the other side of that ram that's blown when Mashiach comes. So it all kind of goes back to that ram. Now that's fascinating. <laughs> now that's okay. And then, just to make it even more interesting, the the rabbis teach that that ram was created at the end of the sixth day of creation. <laughs> so that was a really old ram by then, wasn't it? Well, it depends on how you understand it. It's either metaphorical or it was a really old lamb. Yeah, or ram rather. Yeah. So, you know, de depending on how literally you take that teaching, but nonetheless, God had that ram in mind from the very beginning of creation, which That's included right. the ultimate sacrifice, us giving ourselves over completely to God, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, and the ultimate redemption. Fascinating, which covers a lot of the same themes that Rosh Hashanah has, which is why... Yeah. Right, and because it's all creation, right? Because right. creation has to include the Torah. Creation is not random. Creation has a plan. The whole idea of the Torah is they are the building blocks, the mitzvot, the commandments are the building blocks of creation. And creation itself also has an end, meaning it's pointing toward something. It's pointing toward the perfection of the world. So all of these things are kind of rolled up and foreseen from the very beginning. So... If I'm understanding you correctly, based on what you've previously said, the act of re-energizing yourself in the middle of the year has the same amount of power as God's creation. Yeah. And, and you kind of attaching yourself to God, you syncing yourself with the plan, and you understanding that all of creation is driving toward an ultimate purpose. Fascinating. Wow. Okay. And funny transition. You were talking about cookies earlier. Those are sweet, but you know what else is also sweet is apples and honey. When yeah. did we start incorporating apples and honey into the Russian well, study narrative? I couldn't, I couldn't tell you that, but I will tell you this. What is the idea of honey? So it's honey is sweet. And, and, a lot, and we say to each other, you should have a, a good sweet new year or a sweet new year. Shana tova mituka. That's how you say it in, in Hebrew. Mituka means sweet. Why sweet? Why not just happy new year? Or should have a good new year? That, that sounds pretty good. Why sweet? Because we're going out of our way to get that thought across. And, you know, the first thing that we're doing at the opening meal of Rosh Hashanah is dipping our apples in the honey. So, so honey is playing a key role. So what is it? So, so there are a lot of teachings about it, but the basic idea is this, that every God is good. See, that's a very, very important foundational thought about Judaism. It's, a, it's not just that we believe in God, and it's not just that we believe in one God. We believe that God is good, which means that everything that happens is good, even if we don't understand it even if it's painful or there's suffering involved, 
Since God is good, everything that comes from God is good. But do you know what we want it to be? Sweet, which means we want the goodness of it to be openly revealed and understandable. Like, you know, a person can get fired from a job, God forbid, and then they find a better job, right? But in the moment that they were fired from the job, it's so painful, right? So why do I have to get fired from the job to get a better job? Why not just while I'm on the first job, the phone rings and someone says, hey, we love you. Come and work over here, right? Like it can, the goodness can come down any number of ways. Like I, someone told a story one time and they said, you know, and then, and then she broke her leg. And then this guy was visiting someone else at the hospital. And then he, he went into her room by mistake. And then they ended up getting married. What a great story. And then I said, yeah, but why did she have to break her leg to meet the guy? <laughs> she could have met the guy without breaking her leg, right? So when we talk about it being a good sweetener, that's the key word. That's the, that's the honey. We want the good to be openly revealed as good. Like we don't have to, we don't want to find out later, you know, that, oh yeah, in retrospect, it was good. No, no, no. Let it be good in the moment. So good is everything and sweet is the revealed resolve of that yeah i find it fascinating the tie of that in relation to rosh hashanah and also i guess with something so harrowing as good versus sweet as harrowing as it can be why isn't rosh hashanah and yom kippur the same holiday right Right. So, so the idea is when I was growing up, I didn't grow up um, in a classic Jewish home. And so I didn't have like a lot of the, the, the classic teachings. And in my household growing up, like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were basically the same thing, you know, they were just the high holidays. But as I started learning more and things like that, I, I realized, hey, you know, something, they're very different holidays. So, so the, the first thing is, Rosh Hashanah is all about making God king, like realizing, wow, there is a master to the universe. And then once you really contemplate the, the fact that, you know, like when I used to put my kids to sleep when they were young and I'd say Shema with them, you know, when they'd go to bed, I, they'd be like, well, what does Shema mean? You know, Shema Yisrael, Shema Lukin, or Shema Chad. I'd say that, I'd say to them that, that, that God is one and the whole world belongs to him. And that's kind of the message of Rosh Hashanah. And once you realize that the whole world belongs to God and we're so privileged to be a part of it, we get to participate in creation. This is amazing, actually. Um, then once you realize that, you say, well, you know something? I'm not just responsible to myself. There's, some, there's someone higher. There's something higher than me. And then once you realize that there's something higher than you, then, then you can take accountability for your actions and you can say, you know something? There are things that I got right and there are things that I didn't get so right. And then once you say, okay, well, these are things that I want to improve, then God goes, okay, great. I love the way you're thinking. And anything that you regret having done, if you really want to change it, I forgive everything that you did wrong. So okay. it's like, it's an incremental process. First, you have to realize there's a master to the universe. First, you have to realize there is one who can forgive. And once you realize that there's one who can forgive, who are ultimately responsible to, then, then the forgiveness has a channel to flow down through. Well, fascinating. It's an, it's an incredible concept and it, I've never really embraced Rosh Hashanah to the magnitude that you've described. And I want to thank you for helping me piece together, draw lines between the different dots that I've had growing up all my entire life. And so, David, it's been a real blessing to have you here on the podcast for your second appearance. So uh, thank God. For those who want to see his first appearance, be sure to check out one of the earliest episodes of the podcast called Why Be Jewish. It's an incredible episode that David gives. And um, for those who are listening, please do check out David Sachs's WhatsApp group, Spiritual Tools for an Outrageous World. There's going to be a link in the show notes of this episode. 
And is there anything else you'd like to share, David? No, just that everyone should have a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic year. And uh, remember, the one who's judging us is the one who loves us the most. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Shana Tova, everyone. Thank you so much to my Bad Jew WhatsApp community. Uh, please do check out the spiritual tools for an outrageous world. David, God bless you. Shalom. Uh-huh.